Welcome to Cardio Radio, a podcast of the Ohio Cardiovascular and Diabetes Health Collaborative, also known as Cardio. This is Dr. Michael Constan from the Case Western Reserve University School of Medicine, and I serve as the principal investigator for Cardio, a statewide network of Ohio's seven medical schools. Cardio is funded by the Ohio Department of Medicaid and shares best practices to improve cardiovascular health, diabetes outcomes, and to eliminate health disparities in Ohio's Medicaid population. The opinions and recommendations in this podcast are those of the presenters and not those of Cardio and its sponsors, and are not intended to be a substitute for medical advice. I hope you enjoy today's podcast. I am Dr. Lori Nundial, an Associate Professor of Family Medicine at the University of Cincinnati. I am a family physician and a member of Cardio's Team Best Practices. In this podcast, we will discuss the importance of sleep for cardiometabolic health. We'll discuss what sleep health is and who is at risk for poor sleep, review screening tools for sleep habits, and share tips for sleep enhancement for patients from different backgrounds. I am here with Dr. Jennifer Milano, an associate professor at the University of Cincinnati in the Department of Neurology. She is a neurologist and a sleep medicine specialist. Dr. Milano, thank you for being here. Thank you for having me. I'm so grateful to sit down with you to discuss one of my favorite pastimes, sleep. Many of those in our audience have gone through the gauntlet of medical training with very little sleep and were led to believe that it was a rite of passage to function with as little sleep as humanly possible. While we acknowledge how important sleep is for mental well-being and even cognitive functioning, we may not be aware of how sleep is also at the heart of the matter for cardiovascular and metabolic outcomes. As with many lifestyle issues in healthcare, we seem more capable of defining a problem like sleep in the negative. We know when we're not getting it. Help us focus for a moment on what good sleep is. How do you define sleep health? We could start with a technical definition of sleep. It's a natural and reversible behavioral state of reduced responsiveness to external stimuli and relative inactivity accompanied by a loss of consciousness. Sleep is just a part of our normal bodily functions, and it's very important for us to do well and perform well throughout the day. Sleep health is so important that in 2022, the American Heart Association added it as a part of their Life's Essential 8 activities important for cardiovascular health or heart health. Well, it's good to hear that the American Heart Association is already on board with sleep's contribution to heart health. There seems to be a bi-directionality to sleep. I know when I sleep poorly, the fogginess I experience really shifts the choices I make about food, movement, and my interaction with others. But on the flip side, choices that I make throughout the day, especially closer to bedtime, often have a negative impact on my sleep latency, efficiency, or quality. It's kind of a vicious cycle. What would you say are the main contributors to unhealthy sleep? For many of us, it is that we so often don't achieve that optimal duration of sleep or good quality sleep. The National Academy of Sleep Medicine states that for people between the ages of 18 and 65, it's optimal to get between seven to nine hours of sleep. And because insufficient sleep and poor sleep are so prevalent, many people don't get those recommended seven to nine hours of quality sleep at night. In fact, the Institute of Medicine has reported that 50 to 70 million Americans had a chronic disorder of sleep and wakefulness severe enough to hinder daily functioning and adversely affect health and longevity. Wow, that's like one in every five Americans, 20% of the country. Also, many people, by choice or necessity, are working swing or night shifts. Or they may be having one sleep schedule on working days and a different sleep schedule on non-work days. Very non-regular sleep patterns that also can disrupt our body's rhythms and affect health. As examples, shift work has been associated with an increased risk for cardiovascular disease, breast cancer, and duodenal ulcers. Other influence of sleep include the environment, like noise and seasonal changes, heat and light exposures, as well as a partner's sleep habits, just as some examples. And importantly, with the nearly universal use of handheld devices, bright lights in the hours before sleep do have an influence on our ability to fall asleep or stay asleep, affecting our sleep signals and melatonin production. So I'm hearing that the following factors all play a critical role in sleep health. Adequate sleep duration quality of sleep, in part determined by an individual's satisfaction with their sleep, the timing of sleep, especially what time of day or night, 
one's sleep efficiency related to the environment around them, whether too hot, noisy, or bright, and a fairly regimented sleep schedule for pillow time. That's quite a tall order. With so many distractions and potential interferences to sleep health, it seems all the more important for us to focus on how our sleep behaviors impact metabolic and cardiovascular outcomes. We know that here in Ohio, 33% of the population has been identified as having prediabetes or metabolic syndrome, on top of the already 12% of Ohioans diagnosed with diabetes. So when sleep is unhealthy, what are the cardiometabolic effects? For starters, the 2015 Joint Consensus Statement by the American Academy of Sleep Medicine and Sleep Research Society concluded that sleeping less than seven hours per night on a regular basis is associated with adverse health outcomes, including weight gain and obesity, diabetes, hypertension, heart disease and stroke, depression, and an increased risk of death. Insomnia and sleep duration of less than six hours are predictive of systolic high blood pressure and other risk factors for cardiovascular disease. Short sleep duration also influences inflammatory signals in the drivers of vascular damage and repair mechanisms. So short sleep duration does play a role in the development and persistence of cardiovascular disease as well. As for more metabolic effects, studies in healthy subjects deprived of even just one hour less of their usual sleep in the short span of just three weeks resulted in significant changes in insulin sensitivity and other metabolic markers. Just one hour less each day for three weeks is enough to shift insulin sensitivity. Wow. Short sleep duration also has been shown to influence dietary choices, and those who sleep less than they need are more likely to consume energy-rich foods like refined carbohydrates and fats, and conversely, fewer vegetables than recommended. Sleep also influences our hunger signals and ratios of leptin and ghrelin. Those with shorter sleep duration have lower levels of leptin, which is the satiety hormone, and higher levels of ghrelin, which is the hunger hormone driving dietary inclinations, and in reverse, sleep latency, or the time it takes to fall asleep, and sleep maintenance, or the ability to stay asleep, are influenced by dietary and beverage choices, especially caffeine, but even sugar-sweetened beverages can contribute as well. That hits close to home. We also know that many cardiometabolic factors have recognized time of day patterns or circadian rhythms. We know that myocardial infarctions, for example, are more common in the early pre-awakening hours. And people who have obstructive sleep apnea, for example, are more likely to have cardiac events between midnight and 6 a.m. compared to those without obstructive sleep apnea. It's daunting to consider how many of us and our patients think we're functioning just fine on little sleep and yet are putting ourselves at risk for these cardiometabolic disorders. Thinking more specifically about special at-risk populations, many of our patients work night shifts or swing shifts, especially many from marginalized communities. And there are many folks who travel for work, or especially since COVID, many who are working remotely across time zones with very erratic sleep schedules. They rarely come with the chief complaints about sleep, so... Who, in your experience, is most at risk for compromises in sleep health? In general, people who are at high risk for having sleep health issues are those who are already diagnosed with underlying medical issues as well as those with underlying psychiatric conditions, a vicious cycle fed in part by sleep deprivation. As an example, when we work with people who have prediabetes and diabetes, we recognize that sleep influences the satiety signals with leptin reducing appetite. So in addition to counsel on dietary efforts to reduce daily intake of refined sugars and total calories, a focus on sleep health should have a sizable role in improving cardiovascular outcomes. So not just talking about the dietary components, macros and micros, but also how appetite signals change, and not for the better, because of shortened sleep? That's so interesting. Those who already have been diagnosed with underlying primary sleep disorders, such as obstructive sleep apnea, restless leg syndrome, are definitely at risk for compromises in sleep health. We do see disparities in sleep durations between different racial demographics and levels of household income as well. As other examples, night shift or swing shift workers often have issues with sleep health because they are trying to work at times when their body is actually telling them to rest and sleep. Also, those going through hormonal transitions, especially women in the premenopausal and menopausal years, have well-known sleep challenges. Yes, we do see that a lot. 
My work, though, is largely with the university crowd. How about the effects on our students? Another group is our student population. Certainly, our educational environments and school demands can lead our teenagers and students to have more sleep health issues, especially if they have more of a delayed sleep phase where they become more night owls and they have to wake up early to go to school. On the other hand, some of our older adults, who may be more morning larks or have more of an advanced phase, may have irregularities that contribute to problems with sleep health as well. But some good news is that for individuals who are short sleepers, we see that sleep extension, actually getting more sleep, has been shown to improve direct and indirect markers of insulin sensitivity, for example. That's really hopeful information if we can communicate that well. Dr. Milano, with so many competing priorities in primary care, we know that we may, at times, inadvertently contribute to sleep distress for our patients. What unintended consequences of medical interventions do you see as most impactful on patients' sleep? Well, as sleep specialists, we look, first of all, to see if an individual has an underlying primary sleep condition or any medical or psychiatric conditions that may be contributing to sleep disruption or if they may be on a medication that contributes to sleep disruption. One frequent situation is when someone with hypertension or heart disease is taking a beta blocker. What we know is that beta blockers can be associated with vivid dreams or nightmares. Beta blockers, particularly lipophilic beta blockers such as propranolol, also can decrease melatonin production, which influences sleep. As another example, those with mood disorders, especially anxiety and depression, are affected by poor sleep health, and their illness and sometimes its treatment contributes to sleep disruption. Even common antidepressants such as selective serotonin reuptake inhibitors contribute to primary sleep disorders like restless leg syndrome. Serotonin and norepinephrine reuptake inhibitors, as another example, can contribute to insomnia since both serotonin and norepinephrine are wake-promoting neurotransmitters. We also look to see if there are environmental factors that are getting in the way of sleep health, including whether something in the patient's surroundings may be interfering with their circadian rhythms, such as the temperature of the room, light, noise, safety, as other examples. So it sounds like many of our patients, whether or not they come to us with a chief complaint of sleep problems, could be at risk for poor sleep quality and, by extension, cardiometabolic disorders. With all that we need to cover in primary care and with so little time to address these really crucial contributors to health and cardiovascular outcomes, help us understand what tools are proving most useful for assessing for sleep health. Yes, sleep health or sleep distress remain inadequately assessed with no routine screening recommendations still from many large influential organizations nationally or internationally. I'll repeat the good news that the American Heart Association has now included sleep health as one of their life's essential eight in terms of cardiovascular health. Hopefully, it is a move in the right direction to encourage more primary care physicians to screen for sleep issues. We, of course, have the familiar screening tools for obstructive sleep apnea, such as the Epworth Sleepiness Scale, or the STOP and the STOP Bang questionnaires. The Berlin Questionnaire also focuses specifically on sleep apnea. I think if primary care physicians are able to survey their patients more generally in their sleep patterns, it would certainly add to the effort of improved screening tools for sleep health. Here, you're looking for whether or not they have a consistent sleep schedule, what time they go to sleep, how long it takes for them to fall asleep, and how many times they wake up in the middle of the night. Also, how long does it take for them to fall asleep? What time do they get out of bed for the day? And whether or not they take naps will give you an idea of whether or not a potential sleep issue might be present. Also, asking about drowsy driving, since we know that if someone is not getting enough sleep or good sleep quality, this can lead to drowsiness during the day, a definite red flag for a conversation about sleep. Yes, drowsy driving sounds like a really important clue. Though we need to stay vigilant about the more overt sleep disorders, we can also expand our lens to identify individuals at risk for short sleep duration and circadian misalignment. A good tool for this is the screening tool called Are You Sated? The Are You Sated questionnaire was developed by the University of Pittsburgh. With the Are You Sated questionnaire, R U is for regularity, S asks about subjective satisfaction with sleep, A is daytime alertness, T is timing, or are you asleep between 2 and 4 a.m.? E is efficiency of falling asleep or staying asleep. 
and D is duration, such as 7 to 9 hours. Are You Sated is based on a Likert scale from 0 being rare to never, 1 for occasionally or sometimes, and 2 is usually or always. And you tally up the scores for each of the questions, with lower scores being associated with suboptimal sleep health, and higher scores, 12, being the best associated with more optimal sleep. I really find the simplicity of this Are You Sated instrument helpful, and I'm hopeful that we can build such tools into our electronic health record screening practices. When we do find concerns about sleep quality and quantity, Dr. Milano, how do you advise primary care clinicians to advocate for sleep health, especially for their most at-risk patients? I think emphasizing again that sleep health is important for overall health, that sleep is not a luxury, but it is a necessity for our bodies to function well, and that we do need that rest in order to be our best during our waking hours. We encourage people to have a consistent sleep schedule, making sure that they have a bedtime routine 30 to 60 minutes prior to going to bed, and that they go to bed at approximately the same time every day, as well as getting out of bed at the same time each day. In terms of optimizing sleep hygiene, in addition to that sort of regularity and having a consistent sleep schedule, we recommend avoiding naps as they can directly steal from sleep at night. And ideally, they should keep their bedroom for sleep only. We don't want them lying in bed for long periods of time awake watching TV. We don't even want them looking at devices because the light from the devices can keep them awake. And we don't even want them thinking in bed for a long period of time. If they're lying in bed awake for more than 20 minutes, they're actually training their brain that it's okay to be awake in bed. It becomes a learned behavior and feeds into the problems falling asleep and staying asleep. Also, use of blue light filters or apps may be helpful, but are not as beneficial as eliminating the use of electronics completely. So we should add to our sleep counseling to put away devices and blue light emitters by at least an hour or an hour and a half of bedtime? That's a big challenge. Sounds like I have some work to do on my own sleep prep. Of course, we also like advising people to avoid drinking caffeine too late. Ideally, that means no caffeine after 2 o'clock in the afternoon, if they work during the day, to allow the brain to be able to sleep when they're supposed to sleep. And that includes supplements with caffeine in them. In other words, read the labels. We hope that primary care providers recognize when they need to refer to their sleep colleagues. If there's a concern for sleep apnea when someone snores or if they've been told that they stop breathing when they sleep at night or if they wake up gasping for breath or even having headaches in the morning, then refer someone to a sleep specialist for further evaluation. I recommend that primary care providers reinforce these basics with their patients. And if there are more issues and the individual needs more evaluation, then a referral to a specialist certainly is a reasonable next step. Let me bring in some other common concerns. How about the roles of exercise, nicotine, and alcohol? Are there timing recommendations relative to sleep? Exercise can help people fall asleep and go into the deeper stages of sleep. There are some challenges in terms of when it's the right time to exercise. Some people say that if you're exercising too late, that it may be more activating and contribute to sleep issues. But some exercise, whenever possible, is better than none. And making sure that people are getting proper exercise not only helps them with their cardiovascular health and their brain health, but also can help with their sleep health as well. In terms of other substances, such as nicotine and cigarette smoking, we know that nicotine is activating and can interfere with sleep quality in addition to other health concerns. As for alcohol, sometimes people say that they consume alcohol to help them sleep at night, but it's important to educate people that if they drink alcohol, it may help them fall asleep at night, However, because of its short half-life, when it wears off in the middle of the night, it actually contributes to more nighttime awakenings, especially in those hours prior to planned awakening. Additionally, alcohol is a muscle relaxer, so it can contribute to airway obstruction and increased risk for obstructive sleep apnea. Could you share what you know about the effects of sleep environment and seasonal or climatic changes, that is, the role of heat and light, bright day and dark night on our metabolism? How do these factor in? So our internal body clock tends to run a little bit more than 24 hours. And light is the main thing that trains our brain to a 24-hour period. It's the presence of light received into the suprachiasmatic nucleus that suppresses the release of melatonin. If there's too much light before sleep, melatonin may not be released efficiently or at the optimal time. However, on the flip side, making sure that someone has been exposed to bright light during the day is important to foster wakefulness during the day. So we need both. 
but it's really important to make sure that we emphasize the need to avoid bright lights, even electronic devices in the evening, and that the absence of light is necessary to produce melatonin and help us sleep. So yes, there is a very clear association between light exposure and our sleep-wake cycle. Those circadian rhythms, light and dark, pose some of the biggest dilemmas when we're counseling people who, out of choice or necessity, work at night or have swing shifts affecting their daylight, dark, night rhythms. How do you personalize these recommendations for someone that is going to have to try to sleep in the daytime, as many of our at-risk patients do? So the American Academy of Sleep Medicine has guidelines that are listed on their website. And one of the things that they recommend is if you're going to drink caffeine during a shift, you want to drink that during the first part of the shift so that it is able to completely wash out of your system by the time you are planning to go to sleep after work. The other advice is if you are driving home at the end of work as the sun is shining, make sure that you're wearing sunglasses so that you minimize the amount of bright light that you're exposed to in the morning hours and then making a serious effort to cover any light coming into the bedroom with room darkening shades or window coverings so that you can try and replicate as much as possible that idea of sleeping in the dark. These are such helpful tips, but a lot to educate ourselves and our patients on. As was true for smoking cessation recommendations, we can hope that when we as clinicians recommend a lifestyle intervention or write out a sleep health prescription, Personalizing these recommendations will incentivize our patients towards healthier sleep and many cardiometabolic benefits. What other things, Dr. Milano, are on the horizon that we don't yet understand well enough about sleep? I think some of the things that we alluded to earlier included sleep timing, circadian rhythms, and timing of exercise and other lifestyle choices. We know in terms of circadian rhythms that we not only have our master conductor, the suprachiasmatic nucleus in the brain, but we also have peripheral clocks and all of the different organs in our body. And the coordination between these clocks may influence the best times for exercise and meals. Their being in sync with one another may contribute to sleep health. And so this is still an emerging area of discovery. Additionally, we're still investigating how sleep affects underlying neuroprotective factors in certain neurological conditions such as Alzheimer's disease. We also know that cardiovascular risk factors feed into the risk for Alzheimer's disease, particularly in midlife, and sleep can definitely be a contributing factor to that. Studies are showing that people who have sleep issues, even prior to the onset of any measurable cognitive difficulties, may have changes in the brain that are associated with early dementia. So this interplay between sleep, cardiovascular disease, and brain health is an exciting emerging area of research. Another topic is looking at racial and socioeconomic disparities in sleep health, clear healthcare inequities. There is still a lot to delve into in terms of what, how, how different occupations impact different areas of our population and contribute to sleep health, or the lack of it, and subsequent cardiovascular outcomes. But we know there's a lot to learn here. I agree that's a critical area of research for so many of our patient populations, even more clearly since the pandemic. Well, this has been so enlightening, Dr. Milano. That really is all the time we have today. The main takeaways for me have been that sleep is a necessity, not a luxury, that many patients are at risk of compromised sleep health, and that regular and adequate sleep influences many markers of cardiovascular and metabolic distress. I also appreciated learning the importance of screening for sleep regularity, satisfaction, daytime alertness, the ease of falling and staying asleep, and the timing and duration of sleep, all of which are hallmarks of sleep health in patients with or without known cardiometabolic disease. And I will remember that advocating for sleep health can enhance cardiovascular and metabolic outcomes. Thank you, Dr. Milano, for sharing your expertise. It was my pleasure, Dr. Nandial. Thank you for having me. And a special thank you to you, our listeners, for tuning in to Cardio Radio. This concludes today's podcast. Be sure to visit cardio.org to learn more about the Ohio Cardiovascular and Diabetes Health Collaborative.